my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my October books for you. I couldn't find the thing that would attach my camera to my tripod today and I had a little meltdown because I was like, I can't film and I planned to film today and then I MacGyvered something with another baby tripod. So I'm on the floor in front of my bookshelves. It's probably a better background anyway. To talk to you guys about my October books, obviously I was very preoccupied with Vlogtober so it didn't get around to as much reading as I wanted and it just happened to be one of those months where you read kind of all right book after all right book with the exception of one big big one which I know you guys are probably expecting if you watched any of my vlogtober because I spent a lot of time talking about it. So before we get started next month's book club pick so November's pick I know November's almost over classic me I've done this so so late I have not got around to filming properly since vlogtober ended because I think my brain was like filmed out. I will do uh, a November books probably mid to late December so you have a little bit of time to read it. I hope you can get your hands on it, I don't know how popular this book is but as you know we're coming to the end of my year of buying no books so soon we will be <laughs> fully refreshed um, but for now this is what I've picked for this month. Second to last book club pick of the year I decided to pick a Jane Smiley. Now this is the final Jane Smiley on my shelves I think I had three I have no four I love Jane Smiley I think she's an excellent author I have another Jane Smiley that I read in November I believe I started in October didn't I it was the Greenlanders but anyway, I want to read my final Jane Smiley book before the end of the year, so I thought I'd pick this one today. Now, I haven't heard amazing things about this, sadly, but we'll give it a go anyway. This is Good Faith by Jane Smiley. Yeah, when I say I haven't heard amazing things, as in people have said it's not as good as her other work, I'm sure it's still good. I love Jane Smiley. I'm sure she did a great job. Um, I don't want to put you off <laughs> reading it. But anyway, so, Jo Stratford makes an honest living helping nice people buy and sell nice houses. It's 1982 and Marcus Burns, Jo's new friend from New York, says the old rules are ready to be broken. But are his ideas about how to get rich too big and risky for Joe? And is Felicity, winning, free-spirited and already married, really the one he's been waiting for? Every Jane Smiley book I've read has been on an entirely different topic. This one seems to be more of a kind of middle-class suburban vibe. So we'll see. If that sounds like your kind of thing, um, then I would definitely pick it up and join me in reading my final Jane Smiley that I have on my shelves. I'm going to go out and buy the rest of her books next year because I love her. So anywho, let's get on with the video, shall we? So, my book club pick from last month, possibly my least favourite book club pick I have chosen thus far. It was Edward, Edward St. Aubyn's Mother's Milk, um, which was somehow shortlisted for the 2006 Man Booker Prize. I'm actually struggling where to start with it because I hated it so much. I think my mind has just it has just erased it. Now, if I hadn't picked it for book club, I would have put it down. But I thought I may as well push through seeing as I had the time. Now, what I didn't realise when I picked up this book is it's actually part of a series of Patrick Melrose novels. Now, I've seen them advertised with Benedict Cumberbatch on Sky. They made a whole TV series out of it. Got to say, it didn't appeal to me when I watched the adverts for the television show. And so I wasn't really surprised that I didn't love this book. I just don't think it's my, that's my kind of thing. And another point to make, a caveat, um, is that people say they don't enjoy this particular book as much as they enjoy the other Patrick Melrose novels, which that's up to you guys, I guess, to decide whether that's relevant or not, because this obviously specific one was shortlisted for the man book. So, and it can be read alone. I had no trouble reading it alone, but it seems to come from a particularly toxic place, I mean, all of Patrick, I read up on Patrick Melrose's, like, what happened in the other books, and all of his life, life seems toxic and unhealthy, and obviously it is partially autobiographical um, for Edward St. Auburn, so I want to tread carefully there as well, because it's obviously a method of him working through some of his own traumas, um, but as a standalone book, without knowing the history of abuse and trauma that Patrick Melrose grows up with, when you get to this book, it just seems like a very dark, middle-aged man crisis, and he seems unnecessarily cruel, mean. It just feels depressing. Um, 
and I don't think and because well I say you can read it as a standalone book but obviously if you had all of that background knowledge would you feel more empathetic towards Melrose? Very possibly. So yeah it's a bit of a confusing one to talk about and evaluate properly for me anyway. So it's told over the course of various summers from the point of view of Melrose and his family. The first section opens um, from the point of view of his son who has this kind of amazing ability to um, read situations beyond his age level which was written in a kind of fairly interesting way like I think the book opened probably the strongest and then just got worse and worse and worse um, and then it just was stuffed full of st stuff that I just didn't agree with I thought was ridiculous <sighs> what did I say I mean like Melrose is pretty abominable like he does terrible things that just kind of misogynist and ignores his child and ter just terrible opinions in it which I wasn't always convinced were fully divorced from um, the author or evaluated by the author in a kind of separate way like asking you to think about what the character's doing and whether it is bad it was just kind of presented um, I I wrote here compared to Curtsy's, um protagonist in Disgrace because Kutzi is writing about a terrible, awful protagonist, um, but he writes in such a way that makes you, if you are a discerning reader, kind of think about what's happening and just pass a bit of judgement, whereas in this one I felt it was just like given off as true. Like they go to America for the final summer and it's just so cliched, like opinions about Americans. For example, there was a lot of just unnecessary stuff about plus size people and I just thought, what on earth? Oh yeah, and also the whole book is kind of centred around the idea of inheritance and about Melrose's relationship to his mother and how she's basically giving away their house in France to what Melrose thinks is like a scam, um, spiritual hippie group of people. And so a lot of it is just like pure wrath and bitterness against his mother and the fact of him being disinherited from this house in France which I've got to say is not top of my list of my priority list to read about. In the end I just said it was just endlessly hopeless like there's no joy here there's no light just terrible opinions on things in my point of view so that was my review of Mother's Milk. Anyway in terms of it being nominated for the Booker Prize and stuff like I said I've read best stuff on inheritance I've read best stuff about relationships between family members that might not be very top it might not be very healthy I've read better writing didn't think the writing was amazing and yeah the political ideology of the book I wasn't necessarily sold on either so anyway that's that I feel like because so much has happened since the start of October my brain just cannot remember any of these books Right. Next we're going to talk about The Long Take by Robin Robertson. It is a long kind of prosy poem. It's not very rigid in structure. Some parts are, some parts aren't. Some it, sometimes it just kind of lapses into prose entirely. And it was nominated, it was long listed, I think it was short listed as well for the Man Booker last year, 2018. And it was billed to win by lots of people. They thought it was amazing. So I was very excited to read this book and then just kind of sort of disappointed in the actual reading of it. It's a very noir book in a noir style about post-war America. It's about a Canadian man who goes to various big American dream, uh, American cities in search of the American dream. He's got post-traumatic stress disorder. He's looking at a really kind of important and what is now quite iconic part of American history um, and kind of the cities also that really fostered the whole noir aesthetic and it's kind of just yeah about his encounters there about his experience as a veteran and what I found about this was that even though it was poetry and therefore it was you'd think and I don't know if this is just the English literature student jumping out at me but when I'm looking at a poem I'm thinking there's a lot more there typically than your average paragraph of prose but actually I found this to be very on the nose like it was very like here's what's happening, which is no bad thing, especially if it makes poetry and stuff more accessible and more people are reading it, that's a good thing. But yeah, I just didn't think, I just didn't know what new things it was trying to say to me, whether it was really contributing anything new. And I think, do all books have to contribute to something new ideas wise? But I think kinda, yeah, when you're doing something like this, I don't know, I just don't know if it had anything to say beyond 
oh, I'm going to be noir and I'm going to be kind of a long form poem and it's going to be, that's going to be interesting enough on its own. I think it was kind of relying a little bit on its form and style and genre and maybe the historical context as well without doing like, like pushing it a little bit more, elevating it a little bit more. However, I think it would be an interesting one if you're interested in that period of time, if you're interested in l lengthy poems, um, contemporary poetry, if you are interested in an author tackling PTSD, um, I don't think it's the best version of that I've ever seen or even really the most interesting way of tackling the city you know I'm very into my um, cities at the moment and how authors are kind of incorporating them and making them come alive in their own right and I don't think he was doing anything particularly with that aspect either so yeah I don't know I just felt there was something missing to it and it wasn't a very satisfying reading experience I'm afraid I'm really going in on these books today, I'm sorry you guys, but what do I know? I could not write a book, so. Next we come to the big main event of this video because it took me so long to read it. This is A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. Um, it is one of the longest novels in the English language. It is about a, well, a few families, focusing on one family and all of their in-laws and stuff. A few families in India, in a place called Brampur. So it's set in newly independent India and it kind of follows India as well as these families in grand detail. And it actually only takes, when I picked up this book I was expecting, you know when you pick up a book like this you're expecting to cover like a good 30 years. I think it covers like 18 months or something. Um, I, like when I read Generations of Winter, I think that was like 30 years or something and that was a much smaller book. But anyway, um, yeah, it doesn't actually cover that long of a period of time, but it does so in great, great detail. You get a little bit of everything, apart from, I would say, and I was reading the two at the same time. So I was reading The Ministry of Utmost Happiness at the same time as I was reading this book. And I found it quite interesting to have the two of them speak to each other. Ministry of Utmost Happiness set more in the 90s, I think. And obviously, Seth's book set in the 50s. And they're both kind of trying to almost do a similar thing like uh, in The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, Roy has a kind of cobbled together family of outsiders and in Seth's book you're looking at a family, like a more traditional family and they're both kind of observing the political situation and living through it at the same time. So whilst I thought Seth did a really good job of including so many different perspectives, you know, you had the shoemaker's perspective, the middle class family's perspective, you have um, like whole chapters set from within um, government, within parliament. You have um, Muslim perspectives, Hindu perspectives. So you have all of that and it's a huge mishmash and he does an amazing job of bringing it all together. Sorry, my camera just died so I don't know where it was at but he really does an amazing job at creating that whole world for you and really immersing you within it. However, having read Roy's book at the same time, I'm kind of, I think, hyper aware of where there are just things missing. There were hints of kind of queer elements coming through the novel but they just weren't quite brought to light. I know that Seth was writing in the 90s. Um, you know, it's difficult and different for everyone. I don't expect him to do so. But I think where Roy kind of really explored the lives of India's untouchables and also queer people, people that really are on the fringes of society, I thought Seth ended up just kind of touching on them but never really fully going into it, even in such a big book as this. But I think because I was reading Roy's novel at the same time, I was hyper aware of where the, what the kind of novel was skipping over. Um, and also having read The Lives of Others this year by Neil Mukherjee, which I didn't love that much, um, I also thought th th both of those novels really covered kind of a whole host of true outsiders to India's kind of proper society. And so I did feel that was a little bit missing in a novel which is trying so much to give you the full picture. However, I'm willing to forgive him. I think it's just because I'd read those two books so recently and I'm kind of comparing the two at the same time. I don't think 
it's something that you can expect from every book or this particular book. But I just thought it's worth mentioning because it was occurring to me as I was reading. I cannot imagine, it is so hard to sustain interest over 1500 pages of a book. I was really immersed in it, I always wanted to pick it up, there was never a time when I was like oh I just have to get through like 50 pages a day or something. Um, if I could have read it much quicker I would have done. I found it really drew me in. Now there are going to be people it doesn't appeal to or that do find parts of it boring. There are kind of long political sections, there's a lot of detail about the shoe factory but that's the kind of thing that I'm really enjoying at the moment. I'm really realising that at the moment because I'm reading so many good long books that are just, I just, they just feel heavier on my mind in like a good way, like they explore so much more, they're so interesting, I just like, I'm just loving a longer book at the moment and this is the pinnacle of that obviously, but it really draws you in warmly, it makes you feel part of the family, part of the world. There were a couple of odd plot points I said that felt a little bit out of place by the time they arrived towards the last couple hundred pages of the novel because um, we kind of spend a long time getting there and you're just kind of like oh where did that come from but I mean it was a small thing. Yeah I said overall a great achievement that made me love and sympathise with the characters and keep reading. I felt a bit bereft after I'd finished it. On the front of this book a review by the time says make time for it it will keep you company for the rest of your life and I certainly feel like it is that kind of book that I will remember fondly for many years to come and recommend to people. But yes, it's a long book you guys, you have to be ready to really commit to it and let yourself kind of fall into that world. I keep closing my notebook as if I don't desperately need it. Where are we up to? So we are up to The Refugees by Viet Tan Wen, I think it is, is that how you say it? Wen. This is a book of short stories, I remember talking, I think I talked briefly about this in my, uh, my blog. I'm not going to talk too long about this because I don't have loads to say. It is obviously about um, various Vietnamese people's experiences as refugees, all sorts of different experiences. I just didn't feel, considering I've read so much good literature about the refugee experience, in fact his other book, his first book, his novel, um, I really really liked, it's called The Sympathiser. I read and really enjoyed that so I was expecting a lot from these stories and I ultimately just found them to be a little bit hollow, like I just not sure that he is, I don't want to completely write him off, but I just don't know that he is a short story writer. I think the short story requires real, real talent to create depth very quickly, to make you really care really, really quickly. And I think when is or was a professor, and I feel like sometimes these stories came across as like the professor wrote them so that you can analyse them kind of thing, without having, yeah, like I said, the depth, the something to them that will draw you in for those few pages and really make you remember them. Yeah, I don't really have much more to say beyond that. I've read so many good short stories this year, namely like Alice Munro. Like every time I think short story, I think I want to read more by Alice Munro. Um, she's on my list for next year. I've got to buy a lot of books by her. Um, so yeah, just didn't love these, you guys. I didn't love these. Let me know what you guys thought if you read them. Couple more books, you guys. We have Ivanhoe by Walter Scott. I listened to this, um, which was a terrible idea. Do not listen to this book. I didn't love this book uh, for lots of reasons, to be honest. It's about a knight, Ivanhoe, who comes back to England from France and his father kind of hates him and has disinherited him and he goes and does like a jousting thing and all sorts of things like that. And then there's a big fight between the French and the English. It's all, it's all a big thing. Now I haven't read good Victorian literature for a fair, for a little while, but I still feel like this is not my favourite example of it. It just seemed bogged down by unnecessary detail about things people were wearing or just absolutely random stuff. The jousting went on and on. I mean, because I was listening to it, my God, it was like hours of jousting and I really thought that this that was the end of me. Um, I felt like I should finish it again, I should have and would have given up with this but I felt like I should read it because Or Scott obviously a Scottish author, a very famous Scottish author and a classic Scottish author that I haven't read. Um, I might try some of his books set in Scotland because I feel like I will get on with them better, I just didn't love it. Um, I can't, I can't say much more 
on that front, let alone the problematic approach to Judaism, to women. I mean, Rebecca was an okay character, but everyone really like loves her when I read reviews of this book people were like Rebecca and I'm like she's good but like she's not really she's not really a real person I don't know <laughs> I don't know you guys I didn't love it but I listened to about like 29 hours of it but seriously you should congratulate me but it's not my favorite I'm gonna try other Scott I think I'm gonna try it if you guys recommend other Walter Scott let me know this is not my favorite and I won't be reading it again finally we have Meow um, I don't know if I'm saying that right by Erna Brodbert. I always want to say Erin for some reason. Anyway. She's a Jamaican author. I don't know much about her actually. I believe I bought this book when I was looking for books to accompany my writing on A Brief History of Seven Killings. Kind of glad I <coughs> didn't end up reading it at the time because I don't think the two would have particularly gone together well compared to other books I was picking. I actually read this in November but I'm going to talk you guys through it anyway because I've got it off my shelf now. It is about two girls growing up in Jamaica, one of whom is mixed race, she has um, a white father and a black mother and she ends up going to America and just there's been a lot of toxicity in her life and she's kind of found to have absorbed it and she's taken advantage of and she ends up coming back to Jamaica very unwell and it's a short little book, I don't actually, I feel like I read it so quickly and in kind of a bit of a daze so I don't really remember too much more about it but I remember enjoying it. I think you would have to reread it um, to fully grasp it because Brodbert is writing in a very kind of layered way. Um, she's, there's a lot going on in there about the racial politics of Jamaica at the time and America. Yeah, it's got beautiful language and I think, yeah, it could do to have a second reading, I think, to really get the most out of, out of it. But, yeah a Jamaican author that I hadn't heard lots about and I thought it was good, it was very kind of multi-layered but like I said, because at the moment I'm enjoying kind of longer reads um, I just couldn't quite grasp this one properly enough to make it like super memorable for me so yeah, that is everything from me you guys thank you so much for watching today I will see you again very soon it should be a haul either already up or coming this week and then it will be vlogmas before we know it so super exciting looking forward to seeing you guys again before I go if you like my makeup today you can find it on my Instagram um, it'll be an IGTV just in case you do like it you might not like it at all but yeah thank you guys for watching today bye